reactions. So we'll be looking at a uh, MOF here involving zinc and 4,4 by purity. So let me bring that up. And all I've done is so far just open up the INS file. So I've just opened up the INS file. We go to solve. Oh, great, Scott. Technical difficulty. Oh, I opened up the wrong file, my bad. I opened up the P4P. Let me open up the INS. There we go. Huh, much better, much better. So we go to the solve. Here we go, program shell XT. Now this one's a little bit different. Uh, it's a orthorhombic PCCN space group. Now if we do a suggested space group and also notice that here, PCCN is centrosymmetric. So since it's orthorhombic, if you were to have one molecule in the asymmetric unit, you would have a total of a Z factor of eight. But right now it suggests Z of four and Z prime of one half. So we'll leave it there for now. Now if we go to suggested space group, you see here we get a bunch of different possibilities. So for non-central symmetric, we get a few that are tetragonal, one orthorhombic, and then two central symmetric that are tetragonal and one orthorhombic space group. But I'm going to stick with PCCN. You can try PCCM. If we want, we'll, let's just click on that one. And we're going to hit a solve. Also, what you should notice is the A and B cell axes are very close or identical, and all our angles are uh, 90. So this would imply that this is most likely a tetragonal space group. So if it is, we can at the end, I'll show you how to um, convert from an orthorhombic to a tetragonal space group. So this one's a little bit more advanced than what we've been looking at uh, so far. So we hit solve. So even though we selected PCCM, it came back and found it as PCCN. Now what you're noticing here is probably something maybe you haven't seen before, but whenever you, re you do a solve and there were other space groups, maybe lower symmetry space groups than the one it selected, it gives you the opportunity to select these. So before doing any refining, if you say, hey, I don't think it's PCCN, I, I think it's PCC2, what you can do is you can click on PCC2. Oh, it's the same structure. If you go to PNA2 sub 1, oh, it's not loading. Oh, well. It should load up the uh, different structures. So we'll go with uh, PCCN, and this is the asymmetric unit. Now, it may not look like much here, and that's because this is a central symmetric space group. Maybe something is lying on a inversion center. So all I've done so far is done the solve. It won't let me update the space group, but maybe on yours, if you click on the space groups, it should show you the different ones. We go to refine, change this to acta six. Let's see if it works. Oh, hallelujah, it works. Okay. So here, you know, R1, 10.1, 10.4, uh, 
weighted R2, 31.35. And uh, remember I told you this structure had 4,4 bipyridine, zinc, and actually had silicon hexafluoride, not sulfur hexafluoride. I made that typo in the on the blackboard. So this uh, you may look at this and say, hey, this doesn't look like 4,4 bipyridine and silicon hexafluoride. So now if we do a grow, and what grow does is it, it uh, generates symmetry-related components. So if your molecule or your atom sits on a symmetry site, like an inversion center, a two-fold rotation, a mirror plane, when you hit grow, it will generate the symmetry-related atoms. So you see here that the oxygen, this molecule here is the 4,4 bipy. We've just misassigned uh, the nitrogen atom as an oxygen. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to reassign this oxygen as a nitrogen atom. Let me move these Q peaks. Uh, secondly, once we do that, then you'll see a lot of these will change back to nitrogen. So let's do that. We'll go fuse. Again, what you do is if you right click, or excuse me, left clicked on the two oxygen atoms, right click and change to nitrogen. Now you see that they're uh, nitrogen atoms. Now, if we do a grow, you can see the 4,4 bipy. If you want to grow manually, what you can do is if you right click on an atom, go to Bang, Explore, you'll see the one that's very short. If you click on that, it generates the symmetry related components. So there's our 4,4 bipy. Here is our silicon hexafluoride. So now we, maybe we have all the atom types assigned correctly, so we can do our first refinement. Now to get back to the asymmetric unit, we do a FUSE fuse, and it gets rid of all the symmetry related atoms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just label the atoms correctly before we continue. So again, these 4,4 bipyridine molecules sit on a inversion center. And actually, the inversion center is at the zinc. So you, oh no, yeah, no, yeah, no, I don't, yeah, we'll hold on to that. I'm not sure about that. Okay, you can do the labeling anytime. I just like to do it at that time. So let me update and let's refine. So it doesn't look like, if you look at the max peak of the Q peak is 1.3. Just usually if it's less than two, it's usually either hydrogens or just residual electron density. So there's no heavy atom or any significant atoms left to identify. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the anisotropic refinement by clicking on the football here. Alrighty. So now we've done anisotropic refinement. The ellipsoids don't look too terribly bad. So we'll continue on this uh, quest. And now that we've added, we've done the thermal ellipsoids, we've refined. We can refine one more time to converge.
Uh, one thing maybe it pops up on your radar is, is that this thermal ellipsoid on the fluorine is slightly bigger than zinc. Maybe this will be a problem, maybe not. We'll look at that uh, if we need to in a little while. So now that we've done the thermal ellipsoids, we do the add hydrogen. So I'm going to click on this button here. So as far as the model structure, we're pretty much finished. Refine one more time. Okay, now let's take a look at our data. So we click on the percent sign. So you see there are some, a few outliers that maybe don't follow the linear trend here. So like right here, maybe a few up here. So there may be some that we can omit from the data. So if we go to info, uh, nothing really kicks up on the radar yet, but it may later when we start messing with the weighting parameter, then we can go to the reflection statistics Look at I over sigma versus resolution. We hit go. So here the I over sigma only goes out to about 54 degrees to theta. So either the data wasn't collected beyond this or maybe during data processing, they hit the cutoff at 55 degrees to theta, which is not uncommon. Uh, for people to do. You can actually, when you're integrating the data, you can put a cutoff on the two theta data you want to integrate. So the I over sigma versus uh, two theta doesn't look bad there. So now we'll go here, and since we're already at the cutoff of 55, I'm gonna do omit. negative three, say 51. And the reason I'm doing this is because the data only goes out to 55 degrees to theta. So I'm gonna just cut off a little bit of that extra high angle data and say omit negative three, uh, 51. Now with, this is very, this is common thing to do with molybdenum radiation, but when you go to copper radiation, you don't have to omit as much as you would need to with molybdenum radiation because copper is a lot more powerful the higher angle data is a lot more uh, stronger. But you can put 52, it's up to you what you want to do. It's just that with 51, we're going to get rid of that high angle data that may not be as strong as it should be. So we hit OK, we go here, hit refine. So if you notice, when we look at this structure, we see that around this fluorine atom, there are two electron density peaks. And if we right click and go to bang, you see that the Q peak, Q5, is only 0.87 angstroms from the fluorine. You see that Q7 is only 0.96 angstroms from the fluorine. And you have to kind of wonder, would fluorine coordinate directly to a zinc? So maybe this is not a fluorine atom. Maybe it's something else because you see we have the possibility of two electron density peaks that look like hydrogen atoms off of this fluorine atom. And obviously you can't have uh, hydrogens off of a fluorine when it's already being bound to the zinc. But it's something similar in size to a fluorine because the thermal ellipsoid of the fluorine is not much larger than the surrounding ellipsoids. So fluorine is close to what the atom should be. 
But when you look at this and you kind of see, hey, these two electron density peaks here, they're hydrogen, so maybe this could be a water molecule coordinated to the uh, zinc. And you have to kind of use your chemical intuition and think, when I look at uh, zinc, zinc is usually octahedral. When it's octahedral, you know, you see water molecules that can coordinate to the zinc. There's not very many common examples of fluorine directly coordinating to the zinc in octahedral fashion. Doesn't mean it's not doesn't happen. It's just not very common. So my intuition would lead me to believe that this maybe is a oxygen atom. So if I convert that to oxygen and then we do a refine. You see now that the thermal ellipsoids shrank a little bit, indicating that, you know, maybe we had a, a larger atom than it should have been, and it's more in line with the thermal ellipsoids in its neighboring area. So now we can label these two hydrogen atoms. So select them, type hydrogens, hit refine. And then we need to UISO 1.5. So. But still you notice our R factor is not great. And we've tried most of our tricks to get it to be a reasonable value. So usually when this happens, what I like to do is do a check sif. And the check sif will let me know if there's any major errors with this, with the structure. Maybe if I correct it, it would lower the uh, R factor. So let me go to report. You know, for the crystal, I can see if I have, let me see in class. I didn't put the crystal in there. Is that one? Nope. So we just put something clear. So give me one moment, just add in this stuff. So let me refine. Okay. So I'm just going to do a check sift to see if anything comes up that kind of is very odd about this structure. So now if we scroll down, let's check. So the first A factors, A errors, no problem. This is not anything. So the A errors are <clears throat> more technical things. Now if we go to the B errors, 
he, you know, you read the first beer, it says unicell links A and B should not be equal for an orthorhombic cell, which they are. Now that's uh, something we need to address. Secondly, it says add sim detects new pseudo symmetry element of fourfold rotation, 100% fit. Add sim detects new pseudo symmetry element C glide, 100% fit, and then another C glide, 100% fit. And so here you'll notice that add sim suggests possible new space group P4 upon N CC. We're currently in PCCN. So what this means is that we've detected a higher symmetry space group than what we're in. So currently we're in orthorhombic PCCN. We need to be in tetragonal P4 upon N CC. Now, there are a few ways you can go about doing this. One way to do this is to go back to Olex, do another initial solve, and, and in this case, put in the space group P4 upon NCC and solve the structure. But then we have to go back and relabel everything, which is kind of laborious. So what we're going to do is this is where platen comes into play. So we're going to use platen to convert or to transform our orthorhombic PCCN space group into P4 upon NCC space group. And so that's what we're going to do uh, now. So let me bring up the platen. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah. So you open the PWT shortcut, and what I like to do is have a separate folder that I can put files that I use for Platen in, because Platen, you'll notice when you use it, creates a bunch of additional files, and it kind of clutters up your, uh, your folder that you use for Olex. So I like to make a separate folder, just call it, I call it Platen data, and I, I drag files into there. To use and so the file you're going to need is called the res file so you go to your uh, your directory you find your res file in this case it's going to be cd 1386.res you copy and paste it into the platen file and olex does use platen directly but i like to use it this way because i don't get all those additional files uh, with it so now let me bring up the platen screen It'll let me, yeah, here we go. So now I'm going to go to uh, open a data file. I call it the platen data. I'm opening up the res file. I copied it into a different folder. And what you want to do is to detect if there's add symmetry, you can click on the triangle. So the triangle is going to do a quick search to see if there is additional symmetry present. And so if you read the output, it says, hey, we have, we've detected a, from orthorhombic primitive, we've detected a tetragonal primitive space group. It's 100% fix, a fit for P4 upon N CC. So now what we do is, we go up to the graphical menu. Let me see if that's. Let me bring up. The graphical menu. So this is what the graphical menu looks like and what you're going to click on is add sim shellex. This is going to update your current res file and transform it into P4 upon N CC. So click that and it writes the res file. And now what you're going to do is you need to copy that res file into your Olex folder directory. So what I like to do is in my original Olex folder directory, I call the original one 
CD1386 underscore original in case I need some if it doesn't work I have my original as a backup and then I copy and paste the one from Platin into my uh, folder now there's a few things you need to copy over from your original res file to the new res file and I know this is going to be kind of hard to illustrate using Zoom, but I'll do my best. So from the original res file here, what you want to do is you want to copy where it says LS6 down to F var value. And so you're going to copy those and paste them in the exact location in your other res file. This way you don't have to go back and redo all this additional stuff. So you do control C go to your other res file and you're going to oop. oh I got the wrong that's not the right one. One second. I picked up the wrong file. Yeah, you should get the one that in, from Platinus CD 1386 underscore PL dot res. So from the Platin folder, you want to get the one that is labeled underscore P1 dot res. Copy, paste, and then relabel it when you're in the OLEX as CD 1386A. So from the original res file. You want to copy again that least square six down to F var value. And then you're going to paste it in the same area, least squares down to F var. You just do control V and now you have it installed. So you save this and then we're going to go back to Olex and reopen the file. Share. Now let's reopen the file and it's going to look a little bit different because now we're in a different space group. So we're going to open. So notice that the original res file, I just call original.res in case we want to go back to it, we have it as a backup. So we click on this one. And so now the asymmetric unit is a lot smaller than it was with orthorhombic. So now we only have a quarter of an entity in the asymmetric unit so even though it's tetragonal the there are 16 operators but 16 times a quarter gives us four so that tells us it's going to be four entities in the unit cell so notice again that the space group has been changed to p4 upon ncc you can also do this in uh olex using the platen if you have it installed. If you have platen connected to Olex, you'll see this P-ton in the uh, uh, Olex platform. You just go to Tools, you scroll down to Platin, and then you can select the command you want, and the command you would want is AdSim Shellex. So Olex does it as well. I just like doing it outside of Olex so that I don't get all those additional files in it. So now we're in the right space group, the right crystal system. So we're going to update our formula. We're going to do a refine. And we'll see how this adjusts the R factor. All right. 
this point eight here off the water molecule is probably a hydrogen because it's about 0 0.807 angstrom. So we're going to label that a hydrogen. Set the hydrogen to UISO 1.5. Okay. So now let's do the weighting parameters. All right, not bad, not bad. There's still something wrong. Let me just try this. I'm gonna change the silicon to a sulfur, see what happens. Not much. All right, let's adjust this some more, see what happens. Just checking one thing. One second, and then we'll get started. Let me just check one thing.
I'm just looking for one thing and then we'll, we'll get started. Just checking one thing. CD. Oh, okay, all right. we're on the right track. Just checking to make sure we're on the right track. The hell? Sorry, I'm back now for some reason. All right. We're just making sure we're on the right track here. I was just checking this with a previous uh, one I did, and actually this one's turned out better than uh, the one I did last year, so just making sure I'm on the right track. So I'm just uh, updating the, the waiting parameters to see how low I can get the R factor two, and since it's we're having a little difficulty, I'm going to come back here and lower the omit to 50 degrees. See if that helps us a little bit as well. And so the lowest you can put the omit is 0.01. So after that, you really it doesn't change much when you get to that. So let me just. 0.02, change that to 32. So again, what I'm doing is I'm just playing around to see how low I can get the R. So 15.85 is not bad. Let me check the, so that's okay. Go to report. So now I'm just going to uh, copy that information that usually gives us the check SIF errors from the crystal clear dot SIF. So about the cell measurements. So at the very bottom, we're going to insert those, and then about the device top. All right, that's okay. One point oh oh and T min point five three seven. All right. So now we'll do our check SIF. Now the second weighting parameter is quite large, which would indicate maybe there's something not correct with our structure. But for, for, for everything, it looks pretty right. Or it could be that we had poor data in our data collection. All 
All right, let me share. So now you, even though we have a slightly higher weighted R, you notice that there's no A or B errors. We got rid of the, um, the A errors and the B errors due to the wrong space group. There is a slight difference in the N1, C1, but that's a C error. We could take a look at that. Um, our water, our hydrogens on our waters are quite short, 0.7. There's a way we can fix that, and I'll show you that. But other than that, it's OK. So now let me just show you how you can fix or restrain bonds. And so this is the bond that's too short. And so the way we can fix that is if you select the two atoms, we're going to add a restraint. And so you go to Tools. You go to Shell X compatible restraints, and we're going to add a defix. And what defix does is it restrains the bond distance to whatever you set it to. So I'm going to set it to 0.85. So now we go to work. We refine. Now when we check that bond distance, it's going to be a little bit longer than what it was. So now if we check that bond distance, it was 0.7, now it's 0.84 because we've restrained that bond to be about 0.85 angstroms. And so whenever you have an error that, you know, if, you, if you're looking at water molecules and it says your hydrogen oxygen bond is too short, you can incorporate what's called a, a defix restraint and it restrains the bond to what you want. Or if you have an OH bond that's too long, you can restrain it. It's going to then you can't then the the hydrogen bonding distance from the hydrogen is not that reliable, but the uh, overall bond the hydrogen bond distance from oxygen to oxygen is still reliable. And so that's how you can uh, restrain bond distances by using the defix command. So that concludes in class structure four. I'm going to stop here if you have any questions.